Hiya, and welcome back to this celebration of that motoring icon, the Capri. Now, as the car got to the end of its illustrious life, some very, very special additions were produced, including the Brooklands 280. And we're going to meet up with Chris Baker from Warsaw, who's got an amazing, very rare Brooklands 280 that's done, would you believe, just 28,000 miles. Well, that, that was the last of the loin made. They've got a riven leather interior. 15 inch Brooklyn's wheels and uh, the special paint job. The Capri is something different. You don't see many of them about now. And they're quick. Even soon after the launch, there were loads of special additions to tempt buyers. When uh, Capri was first launched, there was the regular version and there was the GT version. It was always the GT version that actually sort of outside. In fact, right at the beginning, we even did a GT version with a matte black bonnet which was the, simply because people had seen safari, pictures from the safari rally where to prevent the glare off the bonnet you always sprayed the top black. So we actually did matte black bonnets and we did one in a sort of very interesting sort of mustard colour with a, a matte black bonnet. Glyn Watson is the secretary to the Capri Enthusiasts Register. His pride and joy is a specialist modification created by Broadspeed. Broadspeed were based in the Midlands um, owned and run by a, a chap by the name of Ralph Broad, who tuned all the escorts, Anglias, etc, etc, for Ford, and had his own company. And he offered a, a package of modifications for the Capri, um, in this case in the early 70s. Glynn's 1972 Capri has the base modification to the engine, suspension and brakes, as well as the installation of these mean rear louvers. It's got rally seats, and let's not forget that distinctive black bonnet. So there were various little bits of modifications, if you will, inside the vehicle, but generally it was about improving the performance of the car, not only from the point of view of making it go a lot faster, because they increased the brake horsepower from a basic 138 brake horse up to 190 brake. Like its stable mate, the Cortina, it was only a matter of time before the Capri would be hitting the motorsport scene and making inroads into relatively new sports such as rallycross. Whoops, up and over. So we're talking here about a stylish, sporty car with as much practicality as could be squeezed from it with a huge range of engines. The engine range was, was amazing because they started off with a 13 and 1600 and then went to a two litre. And within 12 months, they brought the three litre out, which was renowned you know, the length of girth of the country, if you like, the actual three-litre, there was nothing at the time that could compete with the three-litre Capri. And there was a similar engine configuration in Germany, except they were all uh, a V-configuration engines. It's simply not a major modification to them in the sense that the engine bay is so large that it'll take anything from a 1300 engine where you could virtually stand in the engine bay with it um, and progress from that through to the 1600, the two litre and then on to the three litre. The heady concoction of engine power, drivability and affordability gave rise to more than the average so-called boy racers shelling out for their own caprice and terrorising the honest citizen. I think um, the television series, the professionals had a lot to do with that. Once the cars were a couple of years old and um, some of the younger lads it became available to them, you know, it was just probably um, natural for the, you know, copy the likes of Bodie and Doyle and the like. And uh, that's, sadly, the image is stuck with us. But Ford hit back at the boy racer image by giving long-term courtesy cars to well-known <coughs> responsible personalities, such as Manchester City soccer stars Peter Barnes and Gary Owen. You know, we thought we were the Bodie and Doyle of, uh, of our generation, flying along a little bit, and then all of a sudden in the distance, a very pretty young girl, about 18, I was about 17, 18 at the time, so I slowed down and uh, she had all, dressed all in white, so I thought I'd just have a quiet little look as you'd pass, obviously letting her see the car as well, my sparkling new Ford Capri S. And uh, as I went past, I looked round to see if the front was as good as the back, and it was, but unfortunately as I turned back, everybody else had stopped. And I, uh, a three day old, brand new Capri into the back of somebody else, and uh, it's still vivid to this day. The guy getting out wanting to kill me then realised he was a football fan, thankfully. He, he was a Manchester City fan. He wanted an autograph. 
I suppose every party has to come to an end, to be honest. And by the end of the 80s, the Capri styling and performance was being overtaken by those new pretenders to the throne. These were the XR range of the Fiestas and Escorts and cars like their jaw-dropping RS Cosworth. Cars in this market were just getting bigger and brasher and really the Capri just couldn't compete. I think it was really the XR4 that killed the Capri uh, because Fords weren't prepared to put any more development into it. When it got to the late 80s, uh, then you had so many other different companies who were all over the, that period of time had all introduced their own particular coupe. The Capri had been going for 18 years and I, I think, you know, it's like everything else, nothing lasts forever and people are looking for a change. Although several of the design engineers wanted to continue the Capri, Fords had decided no, chop it and we'll start again and unfortunately they've never regained that position. In 1986 Ford finally killed off the Capri completely and the one millionth 886,647th Capri sadly rolled off the Cologne production line. There's no interest in selling a few thousand cars, it's mass production and it has to appeal as far as that's concerned. So, while the devotees were trying to find a new god to worship, the Ford guys were trying to find a new machine to fill the chasm that opened up after the Capri's departure. The Ford Probe was meant to be the spiritual successor to the Capri, but it widely missed the mark. It was overweight, it was underpowered, and well, it was ugly. The Americans who designed the lines may have thought that it had universal appeal, but obviously didn't understand the way we Brit car fans thought. It just didn't capture what Ford had lost with the, the Capri. Driving it was uninvolving with a lifeless power steering system and poor dynamics. The Ford Pro wasn't even a real car. It was a Mazda MX-6 in drag when it all came down to it. I think Ford really shot themselves in the foot. Um, for the start, they left it too long to replace the Capri. The Japanese stepped in and they've always been playing catch up. In the 1990s, Ford almost got it spot on for the next car on offer to the Capri generation, the Mondeo-based Ford Cougar. This is the two and a half litre V6 Monster. Very much the proud inheritor of the sports coupe tradition with the blue oval on the front. Here, the connection between the Mark I Capri and the Cougar were crystal clear. Both had sporty lines and both were genuinely fun to drive. So why have they dropped the Cougar? Well, we don't really know, but we think it's a shame. We thought it was a cracking car. But looking back at the Capri's history, it was very important for Ford as a company. When they were building the car, it was the first time that the Ford companies in Europe had actually spoken to one another. The Capri was um, a good early example of the Ford companies in Europe, particularly Britain and Germany, talking to each other. If you saw our Cortina programme, you'll remember how Ford of Germany had a rival car to Ford of Britain's Cortina. It was called the Taunus. Can you believe that separate divisions of the same global organisation fought with each other for market share? But this bizarre state of affairs was coming to a close and the Capri project was the start of a brave new world for Ford. By that time, Ford was a pan-European organisation. It was no longer Ford of Britain competing with Ford of Germany. Combining the resources, their ingenuity, the skills and coming up with a truly great car. But with the Probe and the Cougar now out of Ford's UK showrooms, isn't it time for the reinvention of the original Capri for the 21st century? I don't think Ford could ever reinvent the Capri. Uh, they could bring the name back, but there's no way they could bring the car back. It's just not possible. It's a one-off. You've only got to look at the evolution of a lot of the other marks, like Porsche with their 911, the Mini, the Aston Martin, They've all had this pedigree and they've not allowed it to lapse. MG. MG made a big mistake by not producing one for years and years. Then they had to get back into the marketplace. Now Ford have made the same mistake. It's been since 87, it's been 15 years since we've seen this car. It's now so ready for relaunch that, you know, it's got to happen. It just needs to be modernised a little bit. 
uh, like anything that uh, has, uh, we've had all do, we're, we're only going to look at the football kits now. We've reverted back to the old style of football kits. Why can't we revert back to the old style of Capri? Actually, if you really wanted a new car, you could do worse than by importing one of the latest American Mustangs over to here. They have arguably kept the feel of the original Fastback design. Those latest stateside Fast Fords have kept very close to the original brief of flash looks, hot power and affordability. And here's something you may not know. America bought a fair share of Capris too, where it was on sale alongside the very Ford Mustang it was originally inspired by. As a customer in the United States, um, you, were off you were offered both the Mustang and the Capri. And the Capri, as the exotic European import, sold extraordinarily well. But the Capri was never more than just a novelty in the States. Let's be honest about it. It just wasn't big enough for our colonial cousins. When you look at the Capris, the Capris as com compared to the American sports cars of the era, uh, the engines were tiny um, in cubic capacity, etc. The largest engine that they sold in the Capri in the States was the 2.8 V6, which we got as the 2.8 injection. Prior to that, that was the largest engine that uh, was fitted as standard by Fords. The chaps in South Africa did manage to muscle in a, a Mustang V8 into the uh, Capri, and that was known as the Piranha. But that was purely a South African option. And you know, talking about the Mustang, doesn't that bring us full circle? And what do Capri owners have in the way of advice for you if you're thinking of hunting out a classic Capri here in the UK? I'd advise anybody looking for a Capri to buy a decent one. Don't buy the first one they see. Check it over very closely. I think somebody who hasn't owned a Capri before would probably have to go for a Mark III for practicality. Um, get used to a Mark III, um, 1600, 2 litre, 2.8. And if they like the car, then perhaps go to a Mark II or a Mark I, which obviously needs a little bit more looking after and spares availability is that much harder, obviously. Now here's an example of a lucky find, a 1600 XL 1973 model, only used for shopping and the odd trip. It's racked up a paltry 6,000 miles in nine years and then it gets garaged for 13 years untouched. Richard Boys from Widnes heard about it and he jumped and today it's gleaming and still with only 9,727 miles on the clock. At first, it was hard to believe that there was a Mark 1 with just 6,000 miles on the clock. So eventually I went to see it and I just bought it there and then. And all I've ever done really is just uh, take it out now and again and look after it the best I can. And of course, once you've got your Capri, you'll want to keep it MOT'd and legally on the road with replacement parts and advice. And the best ways of getting both of these is to visit the Capri Auto Jumbles and to join a club like Capri Club International. A great feature of the Ford Capri is its ability to be worked on easily by most people, even with limited tools and limited mechanical knowledge. I wouldn't say I'm a hands-on mechanic, but if you open the bonnet, you can almost climb inside with the engine. And even for me, I took the dynamo off two weeks ago and I was looking inside it. With my day-to-day -day car, if something goes wrong, you know, I'd hold my head and take it back to the dealers. So there's a certain magic there in as much as you can roll your sleeves up and have a go. And generally speaking, most of the bits and pieces are available. The panels are more difficult to get, but many of the mechanical components are still available. To analyse what Ford are doing right, you know, we have to realise, you and I, that cars aren't just machines. They've got to hit those emotional buttons as well. So how do we sum up this marvellous motoring icon? Well, to start with, it's British. It was sporty. It's simple. It was something new, it was something different. You can work on it easily. It was first in the field, it was a trendsetter. And it's just a classic design. When I was working at the Halewood plants, just for a bit of fun, uh, I remember writing this poem, so I'll just recite a few lines for you now. Henry Ford in heaven sat reclining in the stars, extolling to the angel band the virtue of his cars. My escorts and capris are renowned on Mother Earth, from pole to pole, from east to west, throughout the length and girth. And suddenly here was the opportunity to buy something that looked much sportier, was probably going to be more fun to drive and would certainly impress the hell out of your neighbours. Thanks gang for being with us on this programme and for looking back nostalgically at one of the world's great cars. And if you've got a classic Capri, take care of it. From me to you, see you later alligator, God bless. Oh, what
do you see? Great for me. Odie and Doyle are driving down the street. They get respect from everyone they meet. It's a three-liter baby and it looks so fine. Odie and Doyle are gonna hit that line. Oh, what do you see? Great for me. We do the stroll. We rock and roll. We do the twist. We've never missed. Do the walk, to say and do the jerk. Hey, baby, you'll want to see it work. Ah, oh, what do you see? Good for me. We hit the line and she's mine 